and I'm Dr. Roger Shanks, a dairy genetics consultant for Holstein Association, also Professor Emeritus from the University of Illinois. I, haven't, did, I did not have to milk cows this morning, but I did have the chance to visit the Illinois State Fair uh, last week. So that, we'll jump right in. What are the uh, haplotypes? Sequence of DNA or a string of markers? I'm also moving some equipment on my on my screen so I can see things. Um, they're inherited together. They're transmitted from parents to offspring, often with, with no changes. Uh, different haplotypes may contain various number of markers. And the haplotypes we'll be talking about are approximately four to seven uh, centimorgans in length. My advancing keys don't always work. Okay, what do we know? We have information of three haplotypes impacting fertility have been discovered in, in the Holstein breed. One also has been discovered in brown Swiss and one in Jersey cattle. These haplotypes were found because no genomically evaluated animal had two copies of these haplotypes. And embryonic or fetal death uh, was suspected to uh, terminate in the homozygous form. They were discovered through the SNP 50K uh, genomic test. Uh, some of you might ask, why can't we also use the 3K test? And basically, we, we could, except there double crossovers might occur within the markers for the 3K test. And those would be more easily missed using that than, uh, than using the 50K. So the 50K is the standard for detecting these, these haplotypes. In terms of our notation, C represent carrier and T for uh, tested non-carrier. Use a notation Holstein haplotype 1 Holstein for the first uh, haplotype, a C if it's a carrier, a T if it's a non-carrier. Similarly, for Holstein haplotype 2, Holstein haplotype 3, whether it's a carrier or tested free of the condition. What are the frequencies of these, these haplotypes? And so they're listed, the first three are for the Holstein haplotypes. We also have information on this slide for Jersey haplotype 1, Brown Swiss haplotype 1, and Rocky Spina, which is, is listed here. You might note that all of these are on different uh, chromosomes, and uh, so that they are, these haplotypes are, in fact, uh, uh, independent. The location is just identifying the, the se sequence or segment uh, within the chromosomes. In terms of frequencies of carriers, if we consider all animals that were for the population, it's been estimated for the Holstein ones are just between four and five percent in terms of their frequency of carriers. If we all look at what's happened most recently, the frequencies of carriers for HH1 is a little bit less than that average at three, uh, where HH2 current births were at uh, six percent and HH3 current births are at uh, five percent for frequency of, of the carriers. And you can see the similar information for the other breeds and Proxfinia. I also should comment uh, on the footnote on the previous page, I identified that this work is done, done by uh, Paul Van Raden of Animal Improvement Programs Laboratory, he and his colleagues, and uh, in terms of estimating the frequencies and also this, this slide in terms of impacting the, uh, how, what's the evidence impacting fertility. So there are various matings. These matings relative to evaluate conceptions were between carrier sires and um, carrier progeny of descendants of carrier maternal grandsires as well. And the result that was determined is that the change in conception rate corresponds to about a 3% loss in conception rate from each of these Holstein haplotypes. And you might notice these three percent is much larger than the standard errors that are, are reported. We then also had information on uh, some. Paul had information on, on stillbirths as well. There are fewer uh, matings that could have and animals that were uh, carried to term in terms of in the sample that they had to evaluate. But in terms of the the significance, all had an increase in, in stillbirth rate uh, and. The hepatite 2, the standard error is relatively large, so that one's not significant, but the, each of the other two are greater than two standard deviations uh, away from mean group. We consider those uh, stillbirth rates, rates to be uh, significant. As I say, the other 
read information is just there for, for your comparison. Uh, Brocky Spinner notes as a similar uh, reduction in uh, conception rate uh, did not uh, tend to have any increase in, in stillbirth rate. So summary of the evidence that we did, Paul was not able to find any of the homozygous genotypes. They were missing both within the population in general, and he also looked at specific matings where he would have had a higher probability of, of finding those, and they were not found there either. And then the data I just showed you, there was a 3% reduction in conception rate from the carrier suicide or carrier maternal grandsire matings. We also had some increase in, in, the, in stillbirth rate. When were the earliest uh, known carriers? Uh, Pony Farm and Linda Chief for haplotype 1 was the earliest known in the uh, early 1960s. Uh, Mark Anthony was in the middle 70s that he was born, a scholar and Linda Chief in the, in the late 1960s. Uh, and these were, so these were the oldest animals that were identified as, as being carriers. Uh, some of you might know that uh, Glenda Linda Chief is a son of Pony Farm and Linda Chief, and what we can also conclude from this information or, or support is that uh, even though Glendale has a, a carrier for the HH3, uh, Pony Farmer Linda Chief was not a carrier for HH3. Okay, what are the results? Uh, we ha all have tested over uh, 26,000 males, and so haplotype uh, 1, there's a 6.1% of those that were tested were carriers or hetero heterozygous for haplotype 1. Haplotype 2 in the males had a frequency of 3.2% and haplotype 3 had a frequency of 4.1%. The smaller numbers between the segments at, indicate that there were 20 bulls identified who were a carrier of both haplotype 1 and haplotype 2. We had 32 bulls that were carriers of haplotype 1 and haplotype 3, 14 bulls that were carriers of haplotype 2 and haplotype 3. The larger numbers within each of the areas represent how many bulls were just carriers of one of the haplotypes. And the other thing you might notice from this slide as well is that we have uh, no overlap in the middle, and there were no bulls that were carriers of all three haplotypes. And this is data based on the uh, identification of carriers that's reported on the Holstein website. We look at females. There were a little over 20,000 Holstein females tested. We have slightly different frequencies of each of the carriers. The haplotype 1 has a lower frequency uh, in the females, 3.5%. Haplotype 2, 4.4%. Haplotype 3, 5.5% among the females. Again, you can see there were 25 uh, females that uh, were carriers for both 1 and 2, 23 that were carriers of 1 and 3, 29 that was carriers of 2 and 3, and the counts of, of the females that were carriers for just one of the particular conditions. So that information on the last two slides, uh, if you wanted to see the raw data for that or look up any individual uh, animal, you can go to Holstein's website to uh, this location and find that information. And it's organized by uh, alphabetically by the name of the animal. What concepts do we need to be concerned about for a breeding program? Uh, one of the important ones, I think, is can you recognize that high genetic animals should not be removed as breeding stock simply because they're carriers of a haplotype. Uh, there's relatively low frequency of any one of these haplotypes. And so there are many potential non-curator meetings that are available for that particular uh, individual to try to take advantage of their outstanding uh, genetic material. The other thing to keep in mind is that the lack of a genome or lack of a genotype does not equate to the absence of the haplotype. Uh, we also need to be concerned about the uh, fertility evaluations and if we're wanting to improve fertility, Daughter pregnancy rate and sire conception rate are still the best, mes best methods to do that. And in, in prior to the information on these haplotypes being available, we had genomics here in this black box and adding in some phenotypes and pedigrees and things. And the geneticist uh, got out some information on daughter pregnancy rate and sire conception rate. How I'd like you to think about these haplotypes, it was now taking this genomics box 
but we're making it a little bit smaller. And now we have some information on haplotype uh, 1, 2, and 3 that are, are, if you would, explaining just a portion of what this genomics box was. And everything's still working to estimate the daughter pregnancy rate and the sire conception rates as before. So to repeat, the, the daughter pregnancy rate and sire conception rates do include the effects that are associated with these haplotypes. If you have an index like a TPI or, or Merit Dollars, they're all, and they have weights on the fertility traits, they're also going to include the effects associated with these, these haplotypes. What is the cost of, of a loss of, of one um, embryo or a fetus in this particular case? And it's going to be looking at several different time frames of when that loss might have occurred. You, one of the things you also need to remember is with Holsteins, we're talking about three different haplotypes. They, we really don't know whether all three are occurring at the same time or whether they're occurring at, at some different times um, in, in the cycle. The other thing I'm looking at here is, is and so we're, we're going to be, the worst case is if the uh, loss occurs at birth. Uh, the best case is if it occurs at conception. Uh, I have done a lot of research on, on dumps in the past. And there we had evidence that the loss occurred about implantation. So just using these three uh, as a comparison of, of possibilities. The other thing that I tried to put on this slide is that uh, geneticists have often used uh, two dollars per day open as a cost of fertility. And, and I'm thinking that maybe we have been doing a, a disservice in not having a sufficiently high cost on, on fertility when we're trying to evaluate what's the importance of, of these conditions. So, I just decided that we can also look at what would it be if it was $5 per, per day open. So in the, in the worst, so we've got two costs associated with three different times of, of loss. Um, to estimate how many days open then, if, if the loss is at birth, we've got the 280-day gestation. And then I was adding back in another 50 days uh, after birth uh, before the, the cow is then ready to uh, conceive again do the multiplication of what the potential losses are. Uh, as they say, dumps like implantation is a little bit after 40 days. Uh, again, give the animal a little bit of time to recover and then having the next heat period estimated that it might occur about 70 days. And if it's at conception, that's the, the best case if it has an impact. And so what you're having, if, if the loss occurs at conception, then you've got to wait for the next heat period 21 days later um, to uh, get the animal bred back. Another thing I should mention on this slide, this is the cost of one loss. If we considered a 100 cow herd, and, and based on the percentages we just, just saw, you, you might, uh, in terms of the, the females, uh, we might have had about five cows affected with one of the haplotypes, if you would, out of, out of the 100. And so if we were going to use a carrier bull for that particular haplotype across the entire herd, what our expectation is, we'd, we'd expect a quarter of those five to have lost it, or 1.25. So in terms of these costs, if you're looking at 100 caliber with 5% uh, frequency of carriers, uh, and you're mating back to the same carrier bull on all the animals in the herd, you'd be looking at 1.25 times these, these costs. Okay, let's get into the mating consequences. So I think this is really where you want to be thinking about using the information. And so we've identified uh, bulls and cows that are uh, tested free of all three of these haplotypes. Made a recommendation that that's going to be okay and the consequences are going to be normal. Uh, if we have then a carrier bull for the first, second, or third uh, haplotype mated against these, these same cows that are, are tested to be normal, what's going to happen? In terms of this, this first calf, everything should be okay, no problems. But I'm going to label it okay, but 50%. Why is why 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 the but? The but is that if we do this particular mating, the calf is expected to be a carrier of haplotype one 50% of the time. So yes, you've got a a, a fine calf this first generation uh, that would not be affected, but you may have in the process increased the frequency of carriers in the next generation. So a problem that you would continue to have to be concerned about. Or the similar way, if you use a carrier two sire, you're going to have a calf that's expected to be uh, a carrier for uh, the second half of the time, 50% of the time. So my shorthand notation is these matings are okay, 
but 50 percent of the time you're going to have uh, calves that are, are carriers. All right. The conditions to avoid, particularly with these haplotypes, is you don't want to be mating a bull that is a, a haplotype carrier for the first the haplotype with a cow that's a carrier for the same haplotype. That should be avoided. And you know why should it be avoided? Well, we're concerned that there will be embryonic or fetal death 25% of the time from this particular mating. Not all the time, but 25% of the time. And and you will from this mating if you if you do it, you will have an opportunity to get live calves. What, what's the situation in those live calves? So one third of them would expect it to be uh, be able to be tested free of haplotype one, but two thirds of the of the live calves would be expected to be carriers of this particular condition. And so it it's the between the concern about the death and the increased frequency of carriers is why the recommendation is to avoid mating um, bulls and cows that have a light carrier status in terms of the haplotypes. And similarly, if we're going to have again, if you've got a favorite bull that's a carrier for haplotype two, your favorite cow is a carrier for haplotype two, I probably avoid making that uh, mating. And again, because we'd be expecting 25% of the time to have the death loss, one third get individuals that can be tested free, two thirds of the time among the live animals, animals that would be carriers. And similarly for the third haplotype. Okay, what other matings are there out there? We could consider mating a bull that is a carrier for haplotype 1 with a cow that's, that's mating that's a carrier for haplotype 2. My shorthand notation is going to be okay but 75, 75%. What are we saying here? 75% of the calves are going to be expected to be carriers of one or two of the haplotypes in this particular situation, with 25% of them being carriers of haplotype 1 only, 25% being carriers of haplotype 2 only, and 25% being carriers of both. And, and so, yes, you, we are, our expectation is that you're going to get some live calves, but you're going to have then among those calves, 75% of them that are carriers of one or the other of these particular haplotypes. Similarly, if you're mating a bull status of one with a cow that has the carrier for haplotype 3, again, you end up with 25% haplotype 1, 25% haplotype 3, 25% that are both. Similarly, for mating a bull that's haplotype 2 and a cow that's haplotype 3, you get the same type of percentages. Rather than making another slide, the other thing you can think about is we also could actually change the labels on the top of, of the parents here. And this first column could be cow status and the second one could be bull status. So if you've got cows that are carriers of haplotype 1 and you're mating the bulls of haplotype 2, this is a, these are the same consequences that you would be expecting. So we've got a, several um, twice as many possible matings here that we were relating in this particular slide. Okay, what are the recommendations that you want to consider? The, the first option is, is keep your cows. Uh, there's no reason to uh, get rid of any of your cows if they're carriers of these particular conditions. And even if you don't test your cows, that's fine. Because if you don't use a carrier bull, the embryonic or fetal death from these haplotypes can be avoided. So from your, so from the rating programs and things, you can, can avoid that. What about the second option? Okay, here we can keep your cows. If you've got genomic tests, have genomic tests to your cows, select your best bulls based on a multi-trade index, whether it's TPI or GTPI, and then avoid carrier by carrier matings. And again, this will allow you to have, uh, avoid haplotypes that would result in the embryonic or, or fetal death from these particular matings. So that, that's the, the second option. Then um, my screen popped up on the side, but I think it's okay. Here what I tried to do is summarize all this information and um, so and I said comment again, go, if we're going to have a 100 cow average, and I know each of your herds that are listening have herds that are above average, but let me use the average just for comparison purposes. Our expectation is you're going to have about five cows that are carriers of haplotype 1, about five that are carriers of haplotype 2, about five that are carriers of haplotype 3, and you've got 85 cows out there out of this 100 that if they were tested, they would not be carriers of any of these three haplotypes. 
So when we have similar bulls that were tested in, and free of all these haplotypes, mating to those, those cows are free, all those matings are okay. If you're mating these bulls that are free with cows that are carriers, this is where we get the okay, but 50%. This 50% of carriers is going to come from the cow side for each of these three matings. Whereas when we've got these carrier bulls mated to our normal cows, here the 50% of the carriers is coming from the cow side, excuse me, from the bull side that was the, the carrier, not from the, the cow side. And I summarized on these diagonals here what, what matings you want to avoid. You don't want to, want to mate a, a bull that's a carrier for haplotype 1 with a cow that's a carrier for haplotype 1. Avoid those the same for haplotype 2 and haplotype 3. These other cells here is if you have a bull from haplotype 1 and you want to mate him to a cow that's a carrier for haplotype 2, that's okay. But recognize you're going to have 75% of the offspring are going to be carriers of one or the other of both of those particular haplotypes. So I, I think this, this table does a good job of, of summarizing the, the matings for you. And I hope you can, can find that useful. <laughs> My screen is not advancing. Okay. What other expectations do we have? <clears throat> You know, there are going to be many haplotypes impacting various traits. They're going to be discovered across the breeds. Some are going to be positive, some negative. Uh, a genome is going to be further explored and exact, exact genes will be identified. And worldwide reporting of these discoveries is going to become standard through the advances in, in technology uh, such as this webinar. <coughs> Excuse me. So what are the take-home messages? Favorable haplotypes impacting fertility are found in 85% of whole genes. I think that's pretty good. The effects of these haplotypes already in, are already included in daughter pregnancy rates, our conception rate, and in indexes of TPI and net married dollars. Conception rate for Holstein was reduced uh, 3 to 4 percent. There was some increase in stillbirth rate, and you want to consider avoiding carrier by carrier matings. I'd like to thank uh, my colleagues Sam and Lindsay who had helped with various parts of the information, putting things together. And here is the reference of the manuscript that uh, Paul Van Raden had uh, submitted to the Journal of Dairy Science. And, and I'm expecting that there will be a uh, decision on this manuscript uh, very soon. And past history is that Paul then makes his accepted manuscripts available on the AIPL website. And so I'm expecting that, as I say, to, uh, to occur very soon. We've had some uh, questions that have already been submitted. And we'll try to go through those questions and uh, give, give the answers to those, and then open it up to, uh, to any other questions that have been generated this morning. So the first one, how much does the haplotype issue decrease conception rate in the Holstein breed? If we had, if matings between unfavorable haplotypes were eliminated overnight, and I know that's not possible, but for our purposes, let's say it could. We expect the conception rate could increase over 0.5 percent, from 31 percent to more than 31.5 percent. We'd also expect that stillbirth rate should decrease almost 0.2 percent. So there we go from 6.6 percent down to a little bit over 6.4 percent. And and if we had random mating within the 8 million national Holstein population, and I know we don't have random mating, but if we did, we would have expected. 4,500 conceptions could have been lost this last year from these haplotypes. So these are sort of the significances or what uh, decreases and consequences I think could be happening as a result of these haplotypes. Great question. Second, how accurate is this? Another great question, one that's more difficult to answer because different components are going to have uh, different amounts of, of accuracies. Uh, I do have more confidence in the results for haplotype 1, then for 3, and then for 2, although all are significant. This is primarily based on the number of matings that were involved in the analysis um, to uh, determine the results. Good question. What are the best practical management strategies to effectively use this information? You want to select the best bulls for your breeding program. And after you selected those, those, those best bulls, avoid carrier by carrier matings. And if you follow these two strategies, I think you can take make lots of progress uh, genetically. 
Is it possible to get uh, bronchospina listed as a haplotype rather than a, as an undesired recessive? My, my inclination is that it may be much more likely that it moves in the other direction, uh, that these haplotypes at some point would become undesirable recessives. Uh, I'm not going to predict when that happens, though. So. Are there any haplotypes identified that have a positive effect on any measured genetic traits? <laughs> So is the milk glass half full or half empty? And I like to look at the positives. Approximately 95% of Holsteins have favorable haplotypes at each of the three haplotypes in fact and fragility. And together, we've got approximately 85% of Holsteins that have favorable haplotypes at all three haplotypes. The other thing to keep in mind is genomic evaluations are based on positive effects of haplotypes. Why are so few animals carriers of more than one unfavorable haplotype in fact uh, this question was prompted from the data that I showed you in the earlier graphs in terms of the frequencies in the males and the females, and not having any that are carriers of three and only have limited number that are carriers of two. Because with, from population genetic theory, we really would ex expect more carriers. But the piece that we're missing, if we jump to that conclusion, is that all tested animals are not from just one population. We've got tested animals that were born over many generations. They actually represent many overlapping generations. And, and, so the, and we can't really assume that these tested animals are considered independent because many are parents and offspring of, of each other and included. And, and so even though if you just take one, that try to pool everything together, it looks like we don't have as many as you might have expected. If you can proportion it down to what's a true population, I don't think we're too far off from expectations. Are these genetic lion mines a species defense against inbreeding? Now, inbreeding increases homozygosity and reduces heterozygosity. However, genetics is pretty amazing that for many life functions, one good haplotype that's found in the heterozygous form is sufficient. So its diversity is the defense against genetic landmines, and inbreeding actually reduces diversity. However, inbreeding plus selection has the potential to focus on the positives. And now I think we're to the point of it being able to open it up for questions from, from others. And you might see a screen similar to this on, on the side. And if you want uh, instructions of how to uh, forward further questions. Somehow I've lost my control screen. So, Lindsay, if you've got further questions, or? Yes, we do have uh, one that was submitted by somebody that registered. Um, we've got a, won't these haplotype combinations be treated with the same importance as undesirable recessives with a subsequent prejudice? Um, I don't know which part of that question I should start to answer first. First, let me ask, though, can you still see my screen? Yes. OK. And so then if you look on the, in the item in the window, people can, uh, is this the question you just asked? Yes. 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 The chat. So people can see that question if they aren't able to see it on their, on their own screen. Um, I mean, my bias is that uh, it would be appropriate to have these haplotypes labeled as undesirable recessives. They are recessives, and, and I perceive that they're, they're undesirable. Um, if that's prejudice, I guess it is. Is there another question? Uh, we haven't had anyone chime in with other questions yet. Um, feel free to use the question box there. We've got um, about half an hour, a lot of time left, so certainly feel free to input any questions that you might have. I guess while we wait a minute here, I will say um, this this webinar is being recorded, and um, we hope to have it up on the Holstein USA website by the end of the week. So feel free, um, if you feel it's been beneficial, feel free to uh, share the link with others when it's online. <clears throat> Uh, 
Okay, Roger. We just had another person ask if the slides will be available to the participants. I assume they're part of the webinar. Is that not correct? Yes, they will be recorded. Um, we can we can probably make um, the slides available too if people request them. Yeah, I think this slide, particularly on meeting summary, uh, I would like to think that's useful to help remember how to handle the haplotypes. Maybe this is the point I put the disclaimer that, that uh, I'm responsible for the preparation of these slides and they may not uh, necessarily reflect all the views of people at hosting. Okay, we've got one more, just a second. Okay, the, the question, are the research projects plan to determine the time of fetal death and other function, functional consequences of these, these haplotypes? Uh, uh, yes, this is definitely a research topic that is, is giving, getting some attention. Uh, I don't have a good handle on how soon there will be any answers for that. But uh, yes, it's, it's obviously of concern because the, the economic cost varies based on uh, when the, the different losses uh, occur. And so yes, there, there is some, some effort going in, in that direction to try to determine that. Okay, we've got a couple more questions rolling in now, so I'll put up uh, the fourth question in the chat box. Okay. All right. Would Holstein consider labeling the 85 to 90 percent accounts that are negative instead of the carriers? Better be positive than, than negative. Uh, the I, I will admit I think this was discussed at at one point. Uh, the concern was that um, we were concerned that uh, people reading these lists would think we were trying to, that Holstein and I being part of that, we were trying to pull the wool over their eyes, if you would, and, and hide what the impact was of, of the carriers and, and of the, the consequences of the different meetings. Um, so that, I think, is part of the reason why that, that wasn't followed, but it, it, it was discussed and tried to evaluate. Okay, oh, the next question is, uh, will bulls be culled by studs that are carriers? Um, that, that is a good question, and uh, I think I, last night I happened to notice an article that Bennett Castle had in, and Horst Derman in one of his, past, one of his last uh, comments was uh, how these studs are going to handle it is uh, it's going to be kind of interesting. Um, I'm, I'm I'm expecting that uh, there will be some some bulls, if you would, if they're considered on the borderline, that will be called for this condition. How many of the elite? Uh, I don't. I'm not sure on what's going to happen with those. Okay, we've got one more. Okay, uh, are there plans to report haplotypes results in 3K tested animals or only 50K tested animals by Hosea Association going forward? Uh, this, this is really a, a very good question. I think it's, it's uh, definitely uh, under discussion. The, the concern right now is if we have um, these haplotypes represent four to seven uh, centimorgans. And, and we could translate that to we expect about 5% crossovers that could be occurring within that haplotype. And the actual concern is, is not a single crossover, but if we would have double crossovers within the markers for the 3K tested animals, so we might, in fact, identify an animal as, as tested free when, because of this double crossover, they could have been a carrier. And so that's part of the explanation of the reason now that we're, we're not inclined to, uh, to, to make that 3K information widely available. Um, 
but I think it's 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 a question that's, that's still on the table of, of whether some of that information will be shared with with owners uh, that are sampling their cows and those types of things. And, and uh, um, I, I don't know the decisions that have been made uh, against that, but I don't think the decisions have been made of a of a procedure to actually uh, carry it out either at this point. Okay, our next question here. I post. I um. They had uh, at the very end. They had save instead of safe. So I hope that I um edited that correctly to uh, make sense. Okay. In future, many more haplotypes could be found. The result, the number of carriers of one or more haplos may increase dramatically. We will possibly make safe matings. Um, I, I think so. Um, I, I think we've got a, a lot of opportunity for that. The the other thing, though, it, that it points out is that um, some of the uh, computer mating programs that uh, different air organizations have or Ultimate from Holstein uh, are, are going to be more useful to, uh, to a number of uh, producers out in the field so that the computer could help check for those things and, and verify those things and, and that uh, you don't have to be responsible for, for doing that uh, if you've got the computer that, that can do it. And so I think what, what really comes out of that is that if we get, as we find more and more haplotypes, that's really, if you would, moving forward with technology, um, uh, having technology to be able to utilize the information and make better decisions in terms of, of mating decisions and, and making better hosting cows for the future. Okay, eight. Uh, well, females that have already been genomically tested, be retested, or looked at to identify whether they are carriers. Um, my understanding is I, there are results on 20,000 females that have genomically tested, and, and carriers have been identified. Um, and so that, that information is available. They, definitely do not have to be retested. And I think if you could, if there's some particular females you're interested in, I think you can go to the, the website, uh, hosting website, and uh, look those females up. Um, next question is, is will bulls and heifers that have genomic info have it labeled on their pedigrees? One of the problems of me being a consultant and working in Urbana is I'm not in Brattleboro to uh, hear all the, the talk that goes up and down the halls about what's going to be happening. So my, my understanding is I think this also is under discussion of uh, when this information will or how it will be uh, uh, available. And, and uh, I'm, I do not have the latest on that. I'll just make a quick comment there. I think everything that Roger said is great. Um, you know, obviously this is something very new, and we're quickly trying to adapt how we're dealing with things. So, um, you know, right now the information is not labeled on pedigrees, and I think, um, you know, staff is still exploring kind of the best ways to handle this information, um, and that'll certainly be a discussion that's ongoing in the very near future. Thanks, Lancy. Is it the case that cows tested genomically correspond with the genetics of the entire 8 million black and white cows? Therefore, as these results projectable? Um, I, I'll put on my satirical hat for just a minute. Uh, and and as, 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 as a Holstein breeder myself, obviously, the Holstein breeders that would have their cows sampled are going to be a better population than all the 8 million black and white cows that are out there. Um, and so I'll, I'll accept that some of the frequencies might be a little bit different. But I think what's, what's more happened is that the elite Holstein breeders, they're at the forefront, moving the breed, and then the genetics from those herds get transferred on to other herds and progressively over time, if you would, does get to the entire eight million population, uh, and so it's it's just a bit of bit of time 
of uh, how soon or, or when it gets there. Can you predict how soon we'll see new haplotypes affecting fertility? Okay, that's a question I, I didn't address. Um, the, the, the three haplotypes that were identified, the progenitor, or the, the oldest animal, was known to be born prior to 1980. Okay. And the AIPL chose not to uh, try to define haplotypes that were uh, more recently if you would uh, discover it and identify it. Part of the, the, the thinking there was to avoid making a mistake of identifying a haplotype that uh, we didn't have a the homozygous class just because there hadn't been an opportunity for it to show up yet. And so if these were ones that were before 1980, and we've had 30 years since then that various meetings have, have occurred. Um, and so I think there could be additional haplotypes uh, impacting fertility within that 30-year uh, window, if you would. Um, but I, I think it, it's going to take some time before uh, they can be uh, identified, because we have to have the opportunity, if you would, for the, the homozygous to appear. If we're going to use the same method that was used for this particular study, uh, perhaps another method of identifying them Will, will come up, and then uh, it might be more quickly that they could be identified. Okay, how extensive was the search for these haplotypes? How many more can we expect if you extrapolate? <laughs> Extrapolating can be very dangerous. Uh, but, uh, okay, I'll try to extrapolate in this fashion. We have some, you remember the black box I had for genomic and that we pulled out the, the three different uh, haplotypes there. We still have a black box for genomic influence, DPR, and SAR consumption rate. Um, the, our, our estimates are that these three haplotypes are explaining less than 1% of the variability on, on, some, on, on DPR. Okay, and so if that's the amount, if, if you just want to extrapolate from that, if we've got three haplotypes explaining less than 1%, you can extrapolate if you'd like. There would be a whole lot more if we're trying to explain all the factors that go into that particular trait. Question 13 and 1. I should mention on these questions that I have no clue who's asking them, so I apologize if I don't give appropriate responses. But 13 here. Has the origin of each haplotype been identified? Meaning, how old is each haplotype and do they come from the same breeding line? Okay. Um, the, a, the, the origin. Uh, no, I don't think the origin, origin has been identified. What's been identified is how far back can we, can, could AIPL go with animals that had uh, genomic information. And so that's why they had the, the earliest uh, known carriers and did not call them progenitors. Okay. Uh, the, and, and so that, that's been identified and, and you know, it's unlikely that the, the means are available to go back much further than those old, or earliest uh, known carriers. Okay. Um, and do they come from the same breeding line? I know there was uh, some situations, and, and I'm sorry right now, I'm not remembering which haplotype it was or which family, uh, that there were haplotypes that showed up in a, another, let's just say, haplotype A was identified and that was a carrier, and they were seeing this haplotype A in two different families. And AIPL was able to sort through, in terms of the conception rate data and other things, that this haplotype A in one family did have a reduction in, in affecting fertility where the other did not, and the other family is therefore not labeled 
as being carriers of that particular uh, haplotype. The other thing to note is with the number of animals that are tested, that there, that it's some, there is some breadth, if you would, to the breeding lines that, that are involved. Uh, and again, to repeat that, a very good question, I think, and, and questions that uh, as additional research gets done, those are some of the some of the questions that we'll have better answers for as, as time goes on. Okay, question 14. Would it be useful to look at the bulls you have used in your herd over the past five years to identify a more accurate estimate of each haplotype frequency in your herd in order to better choose future bulls to avoid potential homozygous matings? Um, that, that would be excellent. The the, what you need to remember with that is the, the bulls you've used half, if, if you use some carrier bulls in the past, half of their progeny will be carriers and half are going to be normal. And unless you test the progeny, you don't know which category the progeny is in. Um, but uh, there's, there's no question you could use some, some screening to, uh, to be careful about that. And if you've already had the practice of avoiding inbreeding, you, you might already be doing a lot of the appropriate screening. But uh, no, a, a very reasonable approach, but it, it has some, you might overdo it in some cases because you're going to have some animals, some daughters in your herd of carrier bulls that are in fact normal. And, and you then would be avoiding a mating that you didn't need to avoid. These have been great questions. Ah, question 15. What other research projects is Holstein Association currently funding or planning for the future? Um, and again, with, with my part-time status and, and housed in Urbana, uh, I, I don't have an answer to that question uh, in terms of related to this particular project. Okay, that's all these submitted questions that we have. Is there any other questions out there that people would like to ask? These have all been really excellent questions. I, I uh, definitely appreciate everyone's participation. Okay, are there any other questions for Dr. Shanks? Okay, we've got one more. Okay. <laughs> All right. Uh, did Holstein USA initiate this line of research, or was this an AIPL initiative? Okay. History is that um, last spring, uh, prior to when uh, Bronchi Spina was identified as Zanzar was recessive, Holstein requested that AIPL look at what are the consequences of, of carriers, and, and what, what additional information can we know about this? And uh, so AIPL wrote various programs to check that particular condition. Once they had those programs written, uh, they concluded that uh, it would be really interesting to apply these to other potential haplotypes that are out there. And so it's it's a question. Okay, did so it's, it's Holstein uh, encouraged one portion, but then AIPL for programs and then they uh, went further in terms of an additional application of those programs and these haplotypes are really a result of, of that. Okay, any other questions? We've got just a few minutes left here. <clears throat> We just had one question pop up that I think that I can answer. Um, this is obviously our first webinar, and I feel like it's gone pretty well so far. So my hopes would be that, um, you know, in the future, as as we feel they can be topical, um, we'd definitely like to host more uh, webinars in the future. I would invite anyone that has uh, feedback or comments on this to certainly email me. 
My email is lwarden at holstein.com. Uh, so feel free to send any comments or feedback on that, and we definitely hope to um, do a few more in the future. Are there any other questions for Dr. Shanks? I will offer, I also can be reached at my Holstein uh, email, which is rshanks at Holstein. Okay, if there's uh, no further questions, I'll certainly give everyone another minute here, but otherwise uh, we can wrap up. Are there any other questions? Oh, we've got one more. <clears throat> and this one might be a little trickier to answer. How is the haplotype info being incorporated into the Holstein mating programs? Um, uh, Multimate uh, is is updated with each uh, SAR summary, and it's it's my understanding that there will be adjustments uh, when the next uh, Multimate uh, comes out in December that includes the information on on the haplotypes. Uh, and uh, that's what I know about where we are at this excuse me at this time with that. Okay, our question queue is empty. Are there any further questions from our audience? <clears throat> and we just had someone ask if you said uh, September or December on availability, and um, I believe Dr. December. Shanks said December. Yeah, when the next SIRE evaluation. Any further questions about the haplotypes? Okay, well, uh, I don't, we don't have any uh, further questions here. I think, um, Dr. Shank, since we said we'd uh, last till 2 o'clock, we can hang out here um, for a few more minutes and ask people um, if people have any further questions, we can um, answer them. Uh, we just had one more pop up. Okay. And it's an easy one to answer. Okay, the, next, the question is, where is List of Carriers to be found? If you can still see my screen, I pulled it up on the, uh, the screen. So it's at uh, HolsteinUSA.com. Uh, pedigree info, genetic codes, traits, HTML. I think there's a link to it from the, the home page. Yes, right Right now we have a, a blue box on the home page. Um, and and aside from that, if you go to um, pedigree information in the main menu and then click genetic codes and traits, all of the information on haplotypes as well as brachyspina can be found on that page. And we just had someone um, say it would be nice to have a searchable or sortable online list. And that's a comment we've heard from a couple people. So I think that's something we're possibly going to uh, work towards in the future is just to have something that's a little more uh, user friendly because it is certainly a huge amount of data that we're working with. I think part of the thinking on listing things alphabetically is then if people are going to be looking up their own prefix they should be able to, to see all their animals fairly quickly.
While we're finishing up here, I would just like to reiterate that the webinar today has been recorded, and as long as all technology functions properly, which I expect it will, um, we'll have this video available on the Holstein USA website, um, hopefully tomorrow, but I would expect certainly before the end of the week. I think it's been a great audience. I've appreciated uh, all the questions. It is strange having to read the questions rather than hearing a person speak them, but uh, we can we can hopefully we handle that fine. And hopefully we have been able to answer all your questions and convey the information that you had interest in relative to the haplotypes. Okay, well, the question queue is empty. It's been empty for a couple minutes, so I think um, we'll go ahead and sign off. But um, from Holstein USA, thanks again for everyone that attended. And, um, again, feel free to send feedback to either myself or Dr. Shanks. And, again, thank you for your time.